Thank you very much, Howard, for inviting me to speak about this. So uh, initially, I'm going to talk about something that isn't specifically a uh, measurement of wisdom, right? So this model, nowhere in this model does it say anything about wisdom, but what really a lot of the, the studies I'm about to talk about, which are really one study, a couple components, are better understanding the constructs of why people differ so much in different contexts of stress. So why is it the case that some individuals exposed to, as much as we can tell, the same sorts of stressors tend to have such wildly different sorts of stress responses? And I showed this figure here, I'm scared to use this pointer, um, because we know, one, it's really complicated, and that isn't just a cop-out. We have good evidence that it's really complicated, and much of it does actually boil down to, in the very end, perception. So what matters mo for most stress responses and, and many individual differences is does the person actually perceive something as stressful? So obviously we could give tons of examples of things that, you know, of a spider phobic, putting a spider in front of them, that's fearful to them. If you're not afraid of spiders, that, that you're not gonna have a stress response. What matters is do you perceive something as stressful? And so one thing that, the w that kind, of kind of touches onto the wisdom with regards to this is the way that individuals have kind of classified stress and exposure to trauma and adversity in childhood. So one thing that tends to happen, and it's kind of out of practicality, is that trauma is described or defined in general usually by checking boxes. Um, does this child, is it in a particular context of poverty, which <coughs> I'm not gonna say isn't a bad thing, that's certainly a bad thing, has this child been, has social services said this child's been exposed to some sort of, um, some sort of abuse? All of these things are kind of what people, usually psychiatrists and, and social workers, want as objective measures, which are fantastic. We need to have those. But one thing that, that is neglected a lot is really trying to dig down and better understand how the child sees it or how the parent sees a particular stress response or how a, a, a teacher-child interaction. So what, uh, one of my students who was sitting right here, Karen Smith, has convinced me to do is, is try to study this in children and better understand why children differ and, and what are some of the constructs that go into that sort of difference. And so I'm gonna step through step by step, but no, I'm just joking. This is really boring figure to, to justify why we would measure something way down here uh, with regards to look, trying to better understand how people's physiology might map onto how they're perceiving their world. So the reason I give this graph is because one of the things we're, we do in the study I'm gonna talk about is we have students wear monitors that record uh, electrocardiogram and we derive high frequency heart rate variability from it on a daily basis every single day throughout a school year and we have very rich data sets on what is going on in that child's life. And the reason why we're using um, this measure isn't because it's the only measure, there's no other measures that matter, is one, it's cheap enough, so that's kind of a boring one, and two, it has been shown across young children all the way through older <coughs> adulthood to be a pretty good monitor of, of the way individuals tend to respond to threats and stress and stressors. So the first question that we initially wanted to have, that we initially had is, do individuals who have higher levels of activity in the parasympathetic nervous system, do they tend to respond differently uh, in the classroom throughout a given uh, school year? And as if anyone needed any sort of justification for why it's important to study adversity, so even if you, we just rely on uh, what I mentioned earlier, these objective measures of adversity, and not pay any attention to perception, something around 3.2 million people have been classified in some, some way or other as being, uh, they have been exposed to adversity or trauma within their life. We think about it, millions of people every single year are being exposed to something that we would consider traumatic, and so that's on the, the spectrum of being the bad, bad, not just having a bad day. And so this is something that obviously in adulthood has a big role, but even in children as young as three years old, um, three to six, which is the population we're working with here, are being exposed to what clinicians are looking at and saying objectively, from their perspective, this is a very bad situation. And again, and we've kind of mentioned a little bit uh, earlier today that a lot of what happens maybe with wisdom later on in life can be molded greatly by what happens on in early in life. So being exposed to particular types of stressors or trauma in early life affects negatively just about every factor we could possibly think of. So 
again, not that we need justification for trying to study uh, stressors in children, but it is important to better classify what sort of stressors, what are the things that actually get under the skin and change the way that a kid behaves, or what, is, what are the things that get under the skin and actually mean something very particular to one student versus another, which is really kind of the foundation for the study I'm gonna talk about. All right, so what we, and I say we, and by we I mean absolutely Karen, um, what she was able to do is get into a school that the school primarily caters to individuals who uh, and across the board have been classified by social services as having or being at risk of being traumatized or having some sort of adversity in their life. So this is a, a selected population, it's not a random sample, but all of these children are coming from difficult backgrounds and the diff different sorts of difficulties, of course. And uh, fortunately for us, we have information on all of those um, difficulties. Unfortunately for us, it's in uh, cardboard boxes on pieces of paper that we've been transcribing for a couple of years, but we're working on it. Um, and so what we want to do with that is, is be able to look within this young population and track over an extended period of time, getting information about what's going on in their, in their house, what's going on in the classroom, what's going on physiologically, to try to come up with maybe a personalized idea of why is it that this one kid is having a bad time and not all the kids. So instead of just treating all stressors or all traumas equally, um, we want to better understand even on a day-to-day -day basis, how does something even minor affect classroom performance, affect stress response, affect uh, physiology? H do the teachers see it? Can the teachers uh, in their student ratings, do they actually see that this kid misbehaves? So that, that was kind of the foundation for the, um, why we wanted to do this study. Let's get through this. 10 minutes is scary. <laughs> uh, just, uh, uh, really? <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, I should just quit. I mean, wow. Um, okay, so we collected a lot of data. Um, uh, wow, 10 minutes goes really fast. Uh, so what we found is that, and, and we just took a sneak peek at some of the data we have, because again, we have uh, physiology on every single kid, just about every single kid, every single day over multiple years. Um, what we did is we looked at the first uh, reasonably clean five to 10 minutes of data within an individual when they come into the program and we wanted to look at how that predicted the number of times they were, um, had they were given safe holds, so kind of timeout holds. And consistent with what one might find in the literature, we find that individuals who have lower RSA, so lower parasympathetic nervous system functioning, on day one or close to day one when they start, actually start out with having more pr problems within the class, su sufficiently bad problems where the teacher needs to hold the child in a safe hold. But the, the interesting part here is what you see is over time, that certainly becomes malleable, Fle it's flexible. And that by the end of the, the average time that in the program, there are the kids who started out with the lowest RSA um, and are maybe the, the worst behavioral problems are doing just as well as the other individual. So even though this might be, and many individuals think of it as a trait, it's something that's absolutely flexible and is changeable over time and does even track even something as, as kind of crude as the number of times a child is being uh, kind of held in within a classroom. And this is something somewhat comparable, whereas we have, the, and these are uh, teacher ratings, so the teacher rates every single day uh, how well the child expresses anger. And higher numbers in this case uh, are better. So they, they do better at expressing anger. And so what we find here again, looking at just the very first part of the data, is that individuals who have the highest parasympathetic nervous system activity do the best on day one. So they're the ones who are actually doing the best and that's consistent with what one might think uh, if you just read the literature. But interestingly enough, again, it, it's not something that's, that's crystal, it's not concrete, it's certainly changeable even to the point where the, the individuals who are actually the lowest in RSA, by the time the, pr the end of the program, they're actually performing uh, the best, best with regards to anger expression. All right, just one minute, wow. Um, so I'll make a giant jump. We're also within the same school looking in uh, at the parents. We're, we're looking at uh, the school's already running a parenting class. And the parenting class is aimed at just increasing perspective taking uh, kind of attention to particular behaviors within the child. And we were fortunate enough to sneak in a couple questionnaires 
uh, to do kind of pre-post to be try to better understand, one, does it work? We have no idea if, it, if the parenting uh, uh, class worked. And then secondly, if it does work, we want to use that because then we want to study how changes in the parenting class might influence the kid's subsequent behavior if we can get access to it. And so what we found is that the parenting class, even though it had nothing to do with stress, stress wasn't the, this wasn't a class about stress, even though all parenting it is about stress, but it wasn't specifically. Um, individuals uh, showed a significant decline in perceived stress uh, after the class. And interestingly enough, we used the brief wisdom screening scale. Uh, we will, and the next time we'll do it, we'll have more thorough scales. Um, we also find that those same individuals show a significant increase in wisdom. And the next uh, iteration we're gonna do of this, what we would like to do is try to determine is this sort of increase in wisdom or decrease in perceived stress, does that actually affect the child? So does it affect the child's school performance? Does it affect the way that the child is on a day-to-day -day basis? And we have day-to-day, -day really hour-to-hour -hour level data at this point, so I'm Gonna go ahead and wrap up now. Jeez, 10 minutes. <laughs> Happy to take any questions. Well, Greg, it looked like the um, kids who were doing worse were simply more variable overall. Was that the case? Um, and you're taught what, which worse? Worse in which way? The kids who came in with the um, less the control of the parasympathetic system where it just showed more variability? Uh, I'm not so, I, I, it's not something like quite across the board um, that they're just more variable. They tend to, on the, just the variables that we picked, that we showed right now, they tend to perform worse. It's not just more variability across the board. I, I guess I'm wondering if they are more sens sensitive to context. And so as the context of the school affects them, if those are the kids that are gonna respond to that context. So yes. And the other kids are just, they that's may be uh, not responding to that's context. That's right. So, so the, the slope lines actually suggest, I mean we, because we're only looking at this small sliver of data set in one school, we, it's hard to say context, but it is consistent with the idea that kind of there is some sensitivity to context that does change this behavior. Um, I, and maybe, you know, respiratory sinus rhythm is able to track that. Um, but that's certainly a, a, a theory that we're entertaining. Yep. Very, very interesting talk, Greg. I have a question, uh, and I might have missed it, you know, because you went You did, fast. we'll just pass it down. Right. <laughs> What's an intervention when before, before you, know, you know, when you showed with the kids' data, first day to, I don't know, day 100 and whatever? So no, no explicit intervention. The school is designed, though, for children who are coming from tough backgrounds, but, but there isn't like a specific year-long okay. intervention in that sense. Okay, so it's just a special school for, you know, troubled, troubled kids. Troubled kids that are maybe So I'm out. wondering if there was maybe not a uh, planned intervention, but you know, one of the things you were saying, the kid had to be held. Mm -hmm. Could this be, right, just by the teachers holding the child, you know, paying more attention to the kid who is more problematic, sure. that this actually is the kind oh, of intervention. A absolutely, there's, there's absolutely. the child who's doing fine doesn't get as much that's attention, I right? Think, I think and that's absolutely also why we find this data set so interesting because we right. can look at that. So we can look and see for these children that get the safe holds the most, are they the ones and we kind of look at a much more time scale analysis right. are the ones that benefit the most. Yeah. So certainly there's not a purposeful intervention, right. but that these sorts of things, there's, there should be some reason they're improving. And because we have so much data, even on a day to day basis and at home, hopefully we're able to uncover things that might not be absolutely obvious because they don't yeah. have kind of an intervention schedule that we would read the pamphlet on. So that's okay, a good point. Great. Mm -hmm. Very cool stuff. Um, just very at the very end, uh, you present two findings uh, about pre-post. Uh, one was with the wisdom uh, yep. measure, and the previous one was the perceived stress. Scale. Perceived stress. Uh, mm -hmm. Does the perceived stress mediate the effect? Uh, the I don't. Yeah, I think we're dealing with a small a small n, and they're hi they're somewhat highly correlated. Um, okay. Yeah, because that would be sort of the. the it would be an obvious. I mean, it, it yeah. would be neat if it didn't, right? Um, they should be somewhat. They could be somewhat related, um, but yeah. we don't have the, 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 we have the data, we don't have the data refined enough to actually statistically answer that question yet. Okay, cool. 
And you used, uh, uh, which HRV uh, measure did you use? Uh, we used the frequency based, so, so high frequency, high high frequency. HRV. Okay. Um, two oh, questions. That one back there. Okay. Um, this is not a normal school. No. Nope. Okay. What would be, what would you imagine the difference to be between a normal school and a ghetto, where there would be lots of stress, and this uh, situation? And then the second question, what do you mean by wisdom in your wisdom scale? I mean higher scores on a wisdom scale. Um, but, I mean, yeah, I don't want to dive into too much further than that. But, but I mean, what what would be the descriptors of? I mean, how how is somebody considered wise on that scale? Uh, I I mean, it, it's a good question. It's certainly something we want to dig down deeper. And it's it's one of the things that we had an opportunity to get the scale in um, while they were running the the intervention and. It, we're going to dig deeper to try to figure out, is it the case that maybe they do, they're more kind of open to experience or any of the potential uh, moderating factors. But at this point, we just have the scale and, and they appear to increase. And it could be because they're less stressed. It could be um, quite a few of these factors. Um, so certainly something we're, we're in the process of exploring um, and that we're interested in, but we just don't have the answers to that at this point. Just as, as the person who kind of devised the brief wisdom screening scale, <laughs> I would be, I mean, I was actually impressed that within such a so short time frame and a rel relatively small intervention, the, the wisdom score in the scale would increase And so for much. an intervention, having nothing, yeah, or exactly. at least Not, yeah. superficially, it doesn't So I would do. really, I mean, once you have a, a larger N or something, it might be really nice to look at which items are really changing or something like that, because mm -hmm. it might be a more, more interesting and more specific story in there, I would think. Yeah, yeah. And, I and in the future, we'll also have a uh, couple different uh, parenting interventions where we'll have the same mm -hmm. scale and many of the other sorts of scales that one might want to look at to see what's doing the work of moving variables around. Hi, thanks. That, that was really interesting. Um, I'm curious about the, um, the parent intervention. And in particular, I guess, is there if you have any possibility for doing a kind of mixed methods design in which you can sort of get parents' own assessments of what the benefits were, for example, the program, and, um, you know, that might lead them to feel less stress. Because, you know, I could just imagine that even feeling like the situation is more under control, their child is at the school, he's doing better, like all of that could just, uh, you know, relax you, whereas before you were in a much higher stress, you know, but, it, or, but maybe there's something about the intervention itself or, or the training. Like and, I, and I think that's why in the future it'll be important for us to use comparable but not the same interventions because maybe it is just doing something for 10 weeks I, I mean we mm -hmm. can't rule that out of course like maybe just getting some information about parenting that you didn't you were not sure about but now you feel a little bit more comfortable makes you feel more in control makes mm -hmm. you feel less stress mm -hmm. um, makes you more open to other ideas mm -hmm. um, certainly mm -hmm. we're that would be great if that turned out to be it we're, we're open to any of those sorts of things but it will be only through comparing this one intervention mm -hmm. to many other interventions over time that we'll be able to look at that sort of question. And do you have, so you have the, you know, the effects of the, you know, of the training, do you have any discussions with the parents or any, any like record of the sort of things that were discussed in the, you know, the training? Like so we, we uh -huh. I like to think we didn't contaminate the parents at all, like we didn't mm -hmm. talk to them or they didn't know mm -hmm. that my lab study stress or anything mm -hmm. along those lines. This was happening outside of actually what we were initially doing and we then convinced them to at the last minute put a couple questionnaires in mm -hmm. and you know we have information about what the intervention is and it um, you know as many interventions it superficially sounds great um, mm -hmm. but we still don't quite know necessarily how mm -hmm. that one intervention might be resulting in a change in, in wisdom mm -hmm. or stress or yeah. anything okay great Thank <laughs> you.